is Diane Pataki, and she's one of my colleagues in the Earth System Science Department at um, UCI. She's also um, a joint appointment in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Um, Diane? Uh, what I want to talk about is the issue of future urban growth. So we know that many cities are growing very fast, especially here in the West. It's true in California. This is a map of the current distribution of urban areas, uh, or the distribution in 1998 as estimated by John Landis and his colleagues at UC Berkeley. And uh, there are many projections of what future urban growth will look like, but here's one for the year 2050 where we see more than a doubling of the extent of urban land. So urban land is growing faster than the rate of population growth in the US and that's because population density is declining. So in many areas, a doubling of population has caused a tripling of the extent of urban land. And it's probably intuitive to people here that the type of urban growth and the form of that growth should influence greenhouse gas emissions. But this has actually been a really difficult thing to study. How does urban form relate to greenhouse gas emissions and how will the future of urban development affect how much CO2 and other greenhouse gases are emitted? So I'm gonna talk about a study in the Salt Lake Valley where we try to quantify this as best we could. And this is an image of uh, the Salt Lake Valley in 1972. In 2002, the urban area is shaded. Salt Lake Valley is very rapidly growing and the remainder of this area in the valley um, will be urbanized in the next 20 to 30 years. And so the question is, how is this area going to be urbanized and how will that affect greenhouse gases? Okay, this has been a really difficult problem to study, and one reason is that we do not have data on greenhouse gas emissions at the municipal scale. Greenhouse gas inventories in the U.S. are conducted at the state level. Sometimes we have quarterly data. There's a lot of annual data out there. What we really want are local scale data on energy and fuel consumption, and there is no mandate for utilities to report information at that small scale. So if you only take home one thing today, it's that we need those data, and we need to mandate that utilities report the data at scales that we can use, which is the scale of cities. So we spent many years actually working with the utilities in the Salt Lake Valley to try and get the data, the valley scale data, on electrical power consumption, natural gas consumption, and this is the work of my colleague, Craig Forster, at the University of Utah. He was successful in getting various types of data on energy consumption in the valley. And so um, this is a map of, of the area. This is a, we got data for this three-county area. And so here are the data. There is a bimodal pattern of energy consumption in the Salt Lake Valley. It's a continental climate, a seasonal climate. There is both a summer and a winter peak. So what we see, this is non-residential and residential electricity use. And in red here are the heating degree days. So in the winter, when the temperature drops below 65 degrees Fahrenheit, we need to heat our homes to maintain a constant temperature. And in the summer, we have the opposite. In yellow are the cooling degree days. And so these two things that, uh, strongly relate to electrical emissions. So the circles in residential energy use are what we're calling the baseline emissions in May. And so if we look at the, the drivers or the factors that really correlate well to energy use in the valley, um, the panel that shows the, the correlation with population, that's showing that baseline emissions have been increasing with population, which you would expect, and the seasonal emissions in winter and summer are strongly correlated with temperature, as you would also expect. And so uh, we can, these, these correlations are very good. So 73%, 62% of the variability in winter and summer Electricity use can be related directly to temperature. And it's just basically a similar story for natural gas, where we got natural gas data as the um, natural gas flowing into the three pipes, the gates that go into the valley in green. There are three pipes. And uh, a pretty similar story, except that for natural gas, there's just one peak, and it's in winter time, because in the Salt Lake Valley, it's very cold in winter. Most homes, more than 80% of homes, are heated by natural gas, and that's when natural gas use is really high. So actually 87% of the variability in natural gas use over this period is directly related to climate. Okay, so now we need to look at gasoline, the CO2 emissions coming from the transportation sector. And this is the work of Philip Emmy, who is an urban planner. He's very interested in the linkage between land use and transportation emissions. So population density has been declining in the Salt Lake Valley, as elsewhere, over time. 
And w during that, that decline, as population density has been declining, so vehicle miles traveled per capita is increasing during that time. Okay, and so this has been conceptualized by urban planners as a mechanistic relationship between population density, urban development, and traffic. And so what happens, the idea is that increased traffic causes more roads to be built. And if you spread out the road network, you spread out urban development, because now further housing and urban land is gonna be built on the outskirts of the city. And that causes more traffic, so that causes more road building, and that causes further spread, further sprawl of the city. And so, this is, we think that this is a positive feedback loop, basically. The more roads you build to alleviate congestion, the more congestion that you get. <laughs> Unfortunately. Okay, so we wanted to put all of this into one model, a decision-making model of fossil fuel emissions that decision makers could use to make projections about how things like urban density would affect emissions in the future. And what we built was a mediated model and so this is the work of Tarla Peterson, who is now at Texas A&M University. And she led a series of five stakeholder workshops where we, um, the scientists, interacted with a number of stakeholders from different sectors, at least one of whom is actually here, which we'll, and we'll hear from her this afternoon. But we talked to people in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, and in government. And we built a model with them collaboratively. And this gets at the issue of buy-in that Dr. Betzel talked about earlier. When you do this, you have much greater buy-in into the process because people are working with you to ask the science questions and to build a model. We also very much wanted to incorporate their local knowledge of decision-making into our model and to choose the correct scenarios that we wanted to look at. And so people drew maps, they, do, they did all kinds of things. I don't have time to get into it actually. And, this is a conceptual model of uh, a diagram of what went into the model. And we, they helped us build an interface that was easy to use, where they could change the factors that went into the model to see what would happen to the output. So I just want to get to the scenarios that we ended up with. In the reference case, we had a business as usual scenario in which the population density continued to decline over time. And if that's the case, urban land area basically will continue to increase exponentially. So we created a dampening sprawl feedback scenario in which the population density is stabilized at five and a half people per acre. And that has a significant impact on the extent of urban land and significantly reduces vehicle miles traveled. We can translate that into CO2 emissions. So the reference case is this dashed line, business as usual CO2 emissions from the year 2009 to 2030. Now, the uh, technology scenario here is where we just instituted an across the board 20% reduction in emissions from all sectors because of energy efficiency or for any other reason. Let's just reduce CO2 emissions by 20% in electricity, natural gas, and transportation. Um, I want to mention that we can monitor CO2 emissions directly from the atmosphere, and this is not something that's done commonly in cities, but it really should be because it's not hard to do. We know how to do it. We can flask sample in the way that Dr. Rowland talked about this morning, fill flask with air. And what in this case we want to measure is the isotopic composition of the CO2. It's basically the mass of the CO2. We're measuring the rare isotopes, the ratio of the rare heavy to the common light isotopes, and if we look at three isotopes, oxygen, stable carbon, and radiocarbon, radioactive carbon, then three sources of CO2 are distinct, natural gas, gasoline, and the biological part, because there are organisms that are biological in cities and, and they exchange CO2 also. Well, we can tell the difference between these sources. So this is kind of a complicated figure, and so just briefly, this is the kind of output that you get if you make those measurements. You can calculate the percent contribution from these sources, biological, plant soil, gasoline, and natural gas over time. And this is at three different uh, stations, basically, in the valley. But this is a way that we can really monitor. We can monitor compliance. We can monitor how people are using energy and try and relate that to various factors to understand the system better. <laughs> 
Another very useful measurement is just to measure the flux of CO2 directly from the land surface, which we know how to do quite well, actually. So for that, we need to mount some instruments on towers that are kind of tall. So in the Salt Lake Valley, we have instruments on a cell phone tower, and these are just aerial images showing where the tower is. It's in pretty common residential neighborhoods, and so we can just measure how much CO2 is leaving that neighborhood directly. And these are the kind of data that you get. This is the average daily time course of CO2 fluxes in the summer, in three months in the summer. So in the daytime, the flux has actually become negative, and that's because plants are taking up some CO2 on a net basis. Unfortunately, not enough to compensate for fossil fuel emissions. But um, if we average this over the day, we get a measured daily flux that corresponds fairly well to our model flux, actually surprisingly well. And this won't always happen because there's a lot of spatial and temporal variability, um, which we can look at in further detail. But I just wanted to mention that we have these excellent analytical tools for measuring fossil fuel emissions directly from cities. Last thing I want to talk about are trees. I'm actually a plant biologist. I got into the fossil fuel emissions business in a very indirect way, but I wanted to put um, some biological scenarios into our model where we look at tree planting because many cities want to plant trees to offset CO2 emissions. So we created a tree planting scenario where the, the density of urban trees was doubled in new development. We're basically going to double the planting density of trees in our new urban land. So here in green is, the, is tree biomass. And in the dotted line is the reference case. So here's the increase in tree biomass that we get by doubling the planting density. And the number of trees, of course, increases a lot. But CO2 emissions in black, you can't actually see the difference between the reference case and the doubled planting density case on this graph. Because planting trees, doubling the planting density of trees only um, resulted in a 0.2% reduction in CO2 emissions. Okay? Now, as plant biologists, we already knew this. But some of you may not know this. We can't plant trees in cities to offset CO2 emissions to any appreciable extent. There's not enough land area, okay? Our fossil fuel emissions are too big. The, by plant, there's great things that you get by planting trees. So because I like trees, I just want to talk a little bit more about that. So here's, here's what happens. When we plant trees, there's an indirect effect of trees on CO2 emissions. And that's because trees modify local climate. And you already know that. When you walk underneath a tree, it's cool. And it's cool in part because it's shady. But it's also cool largely because there's evaporative cooling. The tree is using water. So generally speaking, more tree water use equals more cooling. And here in the West, trees don't naturally grow in our cities. We have to plant them and irrigate them. So there's a trade-off between irrigating trees and cooling the atmosphere. And there are some situations in which planting trees may actually warm the atmosphere. And I won't get into that, um, but it could happen. So basically, we really need to study this further because people are encouraging tree planting in cities for many reasons. And we really need to know what the impact is on the environment. And ecologists have ignored trees in cities generally because we were measuring natural forests and we didn't think trees in cities were important. But of course, they're very important to our daily quality of life. So we are now measuring this in Salt Lake City and also here, actually, in Orange County and in LA County. And I will just leave you with this. Well, you already know, different tree species use very different amounts of water. We have to be careful and make informed decisions about which species that we plant. So this was a study, this was actually done by an undergraduate a couple of years ago where she looked at these commonly planted urban tree species and you can see this is the daily water use of these species in the summer from July to September, huge differences based on species. This species, sycamore, is probably the most commonly planted tree right now here in Southern California. People love this tree because it's a native, it's a California native. But Sycamore comes from riverways and streams. It grows in places where these trees have naturally a lot of access to water. They use a huge amount of water when you plant them on the street or in your backyard, and that might be OK. But we just have to get the data that we need to make the decisions about what kind of urban landscape that we want.